15. Steps to your land patent. The first thing that you need to do is to get a copy or pull your copy or wherever your copy is. But in addition, you get a certified copy out of the county recorder's office as of your warranty deed. The reason for that, that that has your meets and bounds on it. It has your name as the purchaser, <coughs> and it has the land description and the date at which you purchased it. Comes into play in your chain of title. <coughs> okay? The second thing that you do once you've acquired that, you get a complete certified copy. Now I'm going to just stop you here for a minute. I get hit up with the question all the time, do I have to get it certified? Do I have to get the whole chain of title? The answer is equivocally and absolutely. And I'll tell you why in a bit. Best insurance you'll ever get. You get a certified copy of your buy-sell agreement out of the county record. With the stamp on it, certified. Must be certified. Once you get that, you look on your document <coughs> and you look, excuse me, <coughs> you locate your meets and bounds. <coughs> meets and bounds is your, your township, your range, and your section, and the identification where your property is located in that section. And it'll be on your, your, your document. Yes, ma'am. Necessarily, we have the document. I sell real estate, and most of them have been subdivided. They're identified as Rock City, Mountain Myth Subdivision, or whatever. But they probably <laughs> more have a means and balance. Okay, we're going to go to the county surveyor's office and have him help you get. And thank you for bringing that up. Most of the ones in the past have all had your needs and down, and, and she's correct. They've chopped them up so much anymore. You can get your certificate of survey. Sorry. You just get your certificate of survey. But it's in every report. It's in all the reporters' offices. But it doesn't have. Yeah, it, it may not have uh, the official meets and bounds. You have to have meets and bounds. And the reason for that is that's what's of record in the BLM offices where you go get your copy or certified patent. <coughs> yes. These are also referred to as Eloqua. Pardon? Eloqua. Eloqua. Section 31, Township 23 North Range, 18 West. They, they also refer to them as Eloqua. Okay. Yeah. So I've never seen it. <laughs> That's what it's called, this meets and bounds. In the old surveyor. <laughs> but it gives us this. in other words what we're after here folks you're trying to identify where your particular piece of property fits within the original land bed and we call it meets and bounds but <clears throat> your land surveyor can help you do that but most of the time you'll find it in your chain of title too, because, like she mentioned there, and she's correct, <coughs> that at least before they started changing that, you'll find that. You'll need that meets and bounds to get a hold of the Bureau of Land Management, the main office in your state, and request three certified copies, three certified copies of the original land patent that affects your land. Yes, sir. Do you also see that SDR section township range abbreviated that way? Yeah. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> okay. I don't know what they are in Montana, but in the state of Oregon, I think they're $2.50 a piece. Get them certified, and I'll get into why. <clears throat> okay. Once you receive that your copies of the three copies of the certified land patent. You now either have a number of options. 
You either want to go to the county recorder's office, some of it you can do online, and you being in real estate, I don't know how much uh, in-depth information or how far back you can go to research the chain of title or abstract of title. <clears throat> you must be a named owner by virtue of the document that you have that shows that you are entitled then at, the end, at the end of the chain of title as a present to bring your land patent forward. You have to be a land owner, a property owner. It's a requirement. <clears throat> okay? Once you receive that document and you go to the county recorder's office, you can hire people who do that kind of research. The title companies will do it usually for a fee. But you want to get what's called an extensive chain of title or a complete chain of title. All the way from the patent and here's how you verify it. When you get that document by whoever has done the research, compare it with your land patent relative to the meets and bounds. They don't have all of this new stuff on that document. Those are archive records. So they're going to have to have your meets and bounds <clears throat> in order to go to the record, the archive record, and pull your document that's applicable to your land. Are you with me so far? If I'm not, stop me, because it's important that you understand the sequence of events and the number and the items that need to be done. Am I making myself clear? Okay. Don't be afraid to speak up. You don't hurt my feelings. So I don't want to assume that you understand or know if you don't, and there's no embarrassment if you don't speak up. <clears throat> Those documents that you have, if you're paying somebody to do it, if you're paying a title company to do it, make sure, emphasize verbally and in writing that you want them all certified. You say, oh, it costs the money. Yeah, it does. But if you ever get a challenge against you, I'm going to tell you what happens. The reason that you get certified documents, let's just say that these folks here have done their land patent, and I come along and I say, I'm going to challenge this. You know what responsibility falls on me to challenge their land patent document? Yeah. She'll understand this because she's in the real estate business and maybe some of you as well. I now would have the burden of disqualifying every single certified agent who certified those documents before I can ever touch the document or attempt to touch the document. That's the power of the certification of those documents. It's the best insurance that you can possibly have when you're bringing a land patent forward. Get them certified. Yes, sir. You need to make a point as well that you need to have it certified that, that the day that you take it out of the record, the, the copy, or the day that you make the copy, and you can't make copies of all your uh, your chain of title and come back some other day and get it certified. You have to get it certified that day. I'm not. I have a little hearing problem. What I'm understanding you to say. That you had to get them certified that day? Get, them, sir, get the copies that you get of your chain of title. Get them certified that day. Yes. Yes. Don't good good back, point. Don't come back later. And That's correct. Certified later. You want that to be certified before you take possession of it. That way there's no question. I don't have anything to do with it. This lady or man, they're the ones qualified and, and have authority to certify it. If I'm going to come and challenge your land patent, I have to destroy every single certification, <coughs> including the BLM and the original land patent. You with me? My insurance. You talk about insurance, folks. When you're talking about a piece of property that's 200000 300000 a million, whatever the number is, Pretty good insurance. 
two or three hundred dollars to spend on certification of those documents. I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend that you do that. In the 45 years that I've done this, I've only seen two challenges. Neither one of them prevail, and guess why? Absolutely. They were all certified. And the court said, where is your standing to challenge the certification? See, any issue in court can be addressed upon a debate. It's called discretion. <clears throat> you want to reach up and you want to take away that court's discretion. And how you take it away is that this is certified. See the stamp? Because here's the problem with me, the pursuer, after your property. I don't have anything that's certified relative to the chain of title in most instances. And I've seen that attempted twice, and both times the moving party lost. Judge threw them out to get out of here. Pretty good insurance, folks. Okay? Once you have that, those certified documents, you only need to get, by the way, one full copy of your chain of title certified. Once you have your complete sandwich done, and we'll get into that in a minute, you need to make three separate copies plus the original. And it's only for safekeeping. The original is not what you post once it's done, and I'm getting a little ahead of it here. But <clears throat> when you go to post this in a public place, a courthouse, a fire station, library, wherever you're going to post it, <clears throat> do a true copy. Do not post the original. When you go to record it after the 61-day period, you must take the original because they will give that back to you. Now, we've had a lot of problems throughout the Western United States, in fact, all over the United States, in certain instances of the recorder not wanting to record it. I got a whole deal of law here that requires them to record it, and we'll get into that afterward here. Are you with me this far? Am I losing anybody about? Yes, ma'am. When you say you post the chain of title. Hang on a second. <clears throat> When you say post the chain of title, are you talking about just the summary of chain of title or each, all the documents? No, you have a good question. The question was, do you have to have this to summary? You will make a summary from your chain of title. And I show that and you'll see it in my documents here in a minute. But you want to have the total complete enchilada, if I can put it in that term. That way there's nothing missing. Nobody can say, hey, you got an incomplete file. Now your intent to commit a fraud. You see how the how attorneys work and devious people. You want and boy, you understand that point well. The documents get used against you. Exactly. So you don't want to have anything missing. Do not alter those documents. You leave them as you receive them in the certified. But you want to go through them and make sure that they're complete and especially. The certified copy out of the county of your original purchase agreement. You with me? Make sure that that is copathetic, page by page, line by line, etc. Yes. On a certification, who certifies and what type of certification are you speaking of? Just the certification that the county recorder's office gives. It's all that you need. But it, they'll stamp it. Normally they'll use a well different places use different. Some just put an ink stamp. Some of them use them in what is it embossing or whatever that the imprint is on it. The BLM will send you a document. At least they do from Oregon the Portland office. They'll imprint that there, and then they will stamp it on the back. So when you get it, look front and back to see what has been done with it. Yes. If your meets and bounds are different, if your meets and bounds are different. 
what document do you refer to as the one to go off of? I'm not sure what you mean by that the meets and bounds will differ. Well, you made the, you made the point in here that, um, if I can find it, you have to make sure that they are, all the descriptions are the same. That is correct. And if they're not the same, what happens? So you go back to, again, it, it depends on whether you're looking at your document of your original purchase or whether you're looking at a certified copy. You've got to backtrack to find out why there's a discrepancy. And there are errors in that stuff, too. Okay? And so you go to the earliest document for the most correct. accurate That is correct. Document. Now, let me mention something in addition to that point. The whole basis of bringing your land patent forward is contingent upon that BLM reference to the meets and bounds. That is not going to change. You can't change it, I can't change it, and it will not be changed. So whatever that meets and bounds is, that's the framework you got to work with. Yes? I was just going to put a comment. We're in the land search business. I do... Uh... Need to speak up, sir. I can hear you. We do land and mineral search. Have been we've been running title for quite a number of years. If your meets and bounds are different, and they are different, you're on the wrong property. That it could not be an error, yeah. and it's just quite common in some areas, especially with the lady said over there with subdivision and stuff or right. parcels or stuff. You may be on the wrong property. In other words, the document you document you have is not yours. And that's why it's important, and he has a very valid point. Check that stuff out, item by item. Take pains to research and read it carefully, yes. What happens if a property has been subdivided since the package, and you're only doing, a, like if it was 160 acres and you're only dealing with 20? But you can still go back and determine where in that, whatever that region down was, where this subdivision portion is. And I deal with a lot of that. Okay. And people want to add the, the tax lot for the sake of getting the patent from the Bureau of Land Management. It's irrelevant. That patent didn't know anything about a subdivision. Okay? Right, but it, but, if, but your name wouldn't be, like if you're out talking about a, a portion of the subdivision, your name's not going to be attached to that whole subdivision. It's only going to be your portion that is correct. on the BLM records, and they won't have that all the parcels. But that out. doesn't affect what you require and are asking of the BLM. It's irrelevant. Because what's relevant is the meets and bounds when they issued that land patent. And See, we want it. I'm sorry. Here within that, that is correct. That's why you, exactly. That's why you need to know where you're located at. Because if you post this document on the board and you claim somebody else's land, there are people going to jail for that. These documents are legal documents, folks, and they need to be done correctly. Yes. Is it going to matter if in your chain of title or your land is on a government lot? What's considered a government lot? No. Yes, ma'am. Would it involve a, a survey, or should you have it surveyed to be sure that it's accurate? <laughs> A number of people have done that because there has been some confusion about it. But the, whoever does the survey needs to go back to the county survey records and make sure because we used to do everything by the tripod and the, and the transit and whatever. A lot of the stuff now is done with GPS and there are some variances in that. And people like this lady up here that deal in real estate, you find that quite often because the land descriptions or go down to the very foot. Yes. What does government lot mean that Senator Field has brought up? The government lot? Well, the governments have land holdings in different locations for proposed arsenals, for proposed post office, or for, you know, whatever, who knows, whatever. <coughs> so, yes, sir. I'm a posting. How do you have, what's the way you can post it? How do you post it? Yeah, you get your package done. I mean, do you advertise it in a newspaper? You yeah. can, uh, we'll get into that. So let's hold off on that for the time being. Yes. Uh, my understanding of government lot up in our area was a discrepancy. 
wasn't quite 40 acres, it would be 39.5, and so they call it a government lot. Yeah, and there is. Section, yes. there is whatever. Right. But a lot of government lots and stuff were intended for either right of way or road or something that they were going to build. A whole lot of things can be involved in that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Ron, I've been doing this for a lot of years. Have you ever seen a land patent sell to a new owner? And what percentage of your experiences have you seen has given enough of that? To me, you pack the land, that, that's got to be worth a lot more than a horn's feet. Well, it, it is. There are some drawbacks to a land patent. Not many, but there are some. And it is simply this, and I want to mention, thank you for bringing that up. <clears throat> All of the benefits of the land patent that we pretty much covered, there are some more, and we'll get into that. But the, the negative side, if you want to sell that land patent, then in essence, you, the person buying it or acquiring it, needs to have the cash to pay you because they can't go to a bank and get a finance. A bank will not finance on a land patent. What well, turns into a warning by me is Joe Smith wants to buy the land. You could convert it back, but then you lose all of the, the benefit of it. If you're going to look at selling your land and you want somebody the availability, you have to make the decision well, do you want to bring the land patent forward? There are a lot of benefits from it. But a bank will not loan. Why not? Why will not a bank loan on a land patent? They can't foreclose. They can't collaterally attack it. They can't even lien it. They can put a lien on the person's signature. But the bank mortgage and your land are not one and the same. Yes? Well, can't she have both a land patent and a warranty? No. Because a warranty deed represents a marketable title, and you know what that means in real estate. Something that you're able to sell. And with a land patent, then in essence, technically and lawfully, you can't sell a land patent. You can convey it, you can sell the building on it. Let's say you got a, I'll just pick a number, half a million dollar property. The land you grant, you grant, which means you give it. But you can get your half a million dollars for the, even though they're getting the land. But the legal documents required of that, lawfully, you're not supposed to sell a land back. Yes? I have a follow up question. So let's say I have a piece of art and I did this land at the deal. And I want to sell it to Joe Smith. And Joe Smith, just in the 99% database, can't find my land with cash. My question is specifically, do I need to change my land patent back to a warranty deed or would the title company do that real quick? I mean, yeah, they, they would do it if you give them authorization to do it. But that brings up my question. Why then, excuse me, would you go all to the trouble, time, and expense to bring your land back and forward, you're going to turn right around and sell it. I understand, but what if it's in, in your investment portfolio on part of your... Income? And you can do that, sure. Just build an outhouse on it and sell the remember, for half a million. Remember, <laughs> remember <laughs> that you relinquish all the protective covenants by doing that. But if my database of buyers is really small, I might have to do that. And you might. Yeah. Okay. But again, that's your freedom of choice to do that. But to answer your question, yes. What's the situation if you have a loan and you bring a patent title forward, will it trigger a new on sale clause if you hold a mortgage? A mortgage cannot infringe or collaterally land patent. Even if it's in place before. Even if it's in place. If you've got a mortgage, you can still do your land patent process. Absolutely. That mortgage, again, is not tied to the land. That's what they've been doing, and that's what I'm trying to help you folks understand. There's a severance or the division between the mortgage and its authority and jurisdiction and your right of the land. Under land patent. If not, 
then it ties it up because it's in, under, under another jurisdiction. Okay? But a mortgage is nothing but a lien. And I'm going to get into it a little bit today. But let me put it this way. I have challenged and helped people challenge mortgage foreclosure for about seven years now. And in every instance, we have proven that the bank, mortgage company, never loan you a dime. Never what? what did you say, Ron? They never loan you a dime. The mortgage companies, the bank, for 35, almost a oh, little over 40 years, actually, lend their credit. It's unlawful. I've got case law galore. I wish I'd have brought some of it. But I didn't want to get off into the mortgage thing too much because that's a whole subject to tell. They extend you their credit. Your land purchase comes from the power of your signature. We say, well, how does that work? Very simple. When you were born, within seven days of your birth, they, they issue a birth certificate. The original one that's issued is the certificate of live birth. Huh? What are you talking about, Ron? I'm talking about there's been fraud committed upon your mother and your father and against you if you have children. That birth certificate is then sent, the original one, with your parent's signature on it to the IMF, International Monetary Fund, and they hold that. That birth certificate has a number. It's your birth certificate number. Now, your birth certificate number is your Social Security, but it wasn't always that way. The IMF holds that and they monetize it. When you go through a real estate agent or direct purchase, you sign that document of closing, you have a three-day revocation period to withdraw your signature. I think it's the same in Montana, is it? It's not. It's not on a purchase, on a refinance. Pardon? It is not on a purchase, it is on a refinance. Just on a refinance, okay. In Oregon, you have a three-day revocation. In other words, if you sign it today, you can withdraw your signature as long as you do it within three days. Okay? What they do with your signature is they then, on the fourth day, at least from the ones in Oregon and the ones that have a, a, a time period of revocation, they send it to the IMF. The IMF forwards the money out of your account that was established by virtue of your birth certificate. In other words, they've already got paid for your property. I've proven this in court. Numerous other attorneys who represent the clients. We do, when we challenge these types of, of mortgage issues, we do it, and we perform what is called a securitization audit. And what a securitization audit does, it follows your signature from the very document you sign, who it went to, what they did with it to the IMF, and every place when they bundled them up, and the investment groups bought them, they then turn and sell them, or send them to an underwriter. The underwriter then evaluates them. They then send them to Dun & Bradstreet. Dun & Bradstreet rates them, and then they send them to Wall Street, and they're put on the market. All the time, you're getting a payment book. Fraud. We've proven fraud. It's been proven over and over and over. They never loan you any money. They loan you their credit. I got court cases galore. Yes. That document, the live birth certificate, is usually found at Health and Human Services. Yes. At least in the Midwestern state, yeah. that's where I found it. And it's also found in the Office of Vital Statistics. <laughs> so, but they won't give you the original. They will give you the altered one. And that was the birth certificate, not certificate of live birth. Yes. In front of all this part of it. So why doesn't everybody go to the bank, get a warranty deed to a lender, and a few months later file a patent deed? Because they don't know what it's about. But understand, you don't want to do this for the sake of creating another problem. There's enough 
misrepresentation out there. What I'm sharing with you, the reason that you want, I'm suggesting, I'm afraid of that, to bring your land back forward is to protect the foreclosure possibility on your land. If you leave it in real estate, I guarantee you they're going to take it. Yes? Well, within the bounds of the reservation, the tribe, the federal government, well, the tribal lawsuit that they filed in January claims that there was never anyone who proved up their sea captain status so that none of the sea captains issued are valid nor did the Secretary of Interior have rights to issue water rights. So they're saying the Aboriginal title was never broken and no one has ever brought forward their sea patent. So the land still belongs to the tribe. Well, there are some problems with that. <clears throat> Simply because case law shows, and I've researched a lot of that, that there is a statute of limitation to challenge that. And, and we're going to get into that later on this afternoon, hopefully. But to, to address your particular point, once a patent is issued, unless it has a subject to clause of improvement of property, such as you mentioned, then in essence stands forever. If there is that, that reservation, and that's what we call them in patent language, a reservation, then in essence, if they did not improve that. Now, let me give you an example to illustrate your point. In Oregon, we have seven counties that were affected by legislation back in 1937. It's called the ONC Act, Oregon and California. And the purpose for that is we have tremendous timber wealth where I live. And in that, it was determined by Congress if the economy went up or down because those communities and those seven counties were totally dependent upon the timber revenues, okay? And for those of you who work in county government or whatever understand, well, that's a yo-yo a line. They implemented an act of Congress called the ONC Act that stated that timber will be harvested to the fullest no matter what the economic condition is. Well, then the environmentalists come along and they say, we got a lizard, we got a spotted owl. Those weren't reasons, they were excuses to strangle the economy of our part of the country and, and yours as well. So we started doing investigation, I was part of the investigative team to determine where the legal standing was. And I met with some timber people by the name of Swansons. They own a mill, in fact, only the one with a few mills left, at a meeting with the county commissioners. And we addressed the issue that by a congressional grant, oh, and the legislation is in fact a grant. Why don't you pursue it on the basis of the grant? And that attorney for uh, Swanson Lumber Company said, wow. And I said, let me back it up. And I pulled out of my file a New Mexico versus United States 1978 case. The Supreme Court said in that case, said that the, the Organic Act in 1897 that established the National Forest were for two reasons. Two. They were for this continual harvest of timber, and it was for the continual supply of water. Two reasons. None of this environmental garbage, the recreation stuff was not a part of that enactment. <laughs> that's a luxury, that's not a right relative to the organic debt. And when I presented that to that attorney and I gave him a copy of it, man, I mean, he backed away from the table and he's going through that like Sherman through Georgia. <laughs> and he said, where did you get this? I said, it's part of my file. He then went and talked to his uh, bosses, the uh, Swanson Group, some brothers, the family-owned timber uh, mill. They filed suit, and they won. The federal court said that the Bureau of Land Management 
you're to start harvesting timber to the full amount under the ONC Act. So now they're getting ready to start harvesting timber. It's good in our country, or county, yes. Is that ONC Act applicable only to Oregon and California, or is that then brought based over the rest of the state? No, it's only applicable to those seven counties. Seven mm -hmm. counties. Okay. I don't know what Montana has. I haven't done that much research into the timber side of Montana, <clears throat> but uh, the ONC Act was for the purpose of continual harvest of timber so that the tax revenues that would come off that would sustain the counties, that they were resource counties. And it gutted those counties. Literally gutted, because then industry wouldn't come in, simply because then they wanted to stack all the tax load on the new industry. And they had not county facilities to support the new industry. Ron, well, you said it was 1978? 1937. 1937. It's called the ONC Act. You can go to your computer, Google it in, Yahoo it in, whatever. What was that, Organic Act? The Organic Act, 1897. That's what created the National Forest, officially. That only affects Pardon? Are the seven counties or the whole National Forest? Yeah, of all of the National Forest. Yeah. So that would have put in Montana also? No. Yes. No. No. Only the Oregon. No. 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 It established all of the National Forest. Okay? And then they split them up. The portion, the low level stuff was handled by the Bureau of Land Management. And the certain elevation and above is to be the Department of Agriculture, U.S. Forest Service. Okay? So getting back to the patent issue, once you get those documents, your chain of title, you have your certified copies from the Bureau of Land Management, now we're going to construct the document itself. This is very critical. And I want to take you to that. <clears throat> you go to page 118. And I want you to pay very close attention. And there's a reason for that. Are you all there that are going there? Okay. At the very top, of this document, you want to put the United States of America and in the Republic State of Montana, okay? Now, notice that the state is in lower case. I didn't make a mistake. I didn't blow it. There's a reason for it. You're talking about a Republic State, not a corporate state. This document refers back to the original patent, which is under constitutional law, which is virtually uh, uh, based upon common law. We're talking about the Republic standing here. And this is one of mine, personally. <clears throat> and I put Ron Gibson, Kara, P.O. Box, da -da, da 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 You put your address in there, Republic, U.S. lowercase, America uppercase. And underneath that, I have non-domestic. Ron, why did you do that? I'll tell you why. You want to be very, very careful and sure that you are not subjecting yourself into administrative jurisdiction. Because if you do, it invalidates this document and it's standing till you carry that land patent forward. Okay? Does everyone understand that? So when you go to do your document, or Rex is helping you with it or whatever, you want to make very careful that the items are followed that I've got, and then we're going to get into some more items. Somebody held their hand up. Yes? I'm sorry? Yes, you can send it. But can you put your actual address in your... If you put your actual address or post office box, the law says that you have to 
to list where your domicile. Domicile can be your workplace, it can be your home, or whatever, or where you get mail. I've had people try to tell me, well, that isn't lawful for you to do it that way. I looked it up, and it is lawful. You have those three options. Okay? <clears throat> do not, do not use a zip code. I'm going to tell you a little story about a zip code. When you use a zip code, you are acknowledging and surrendering your address, home, business, whatever it is, that you are in a federal district. When you do that, all of the government bull stuff that comes out of the northbound sphere is subject you to that jurisdiction. I've had people argue, and I wish I'd have brought it, and I don't want to get into it all today, don't have time. Your zip code, you're making acknowledgement that you are under federal jurisdiction. Yes? Would I need to make a declaration of my domicile then? No. I don't want to get into the whole thing about domicile, but, no. you know, because you have you to keep your yourself domicile. out. As long as you don't use capital letters in your name, you can use upper and lower, but that's your Christian name. But you do not use capital letters and do not use a zip code. As far as the name goes, does that apply for if it was an LLP or an LLC? I mean, it's the ownership entity, or does it have to be a personal name? No, it has to be brought forward in your personal name. That has major problems. Yeah, major yeah. Patents were issued for the individual. Well, people, not now. <laughs> well, there's a remedy to that. Don't, don't get discouraged. There's a remedy to that. Okay? Quit claiming it to an individual, do your land patent, and then do your conveyance back to the corporation. Of that. That's done all the time. Yes? Are there any other restrictions that you put, you know, so I live at 112 something road or avenue or anything? No, whatever your address is, that works. You'd write out the word right. rather than RD period. Okay. Yeah, whatever your address is, that's what it is. But do not use a zip code. Ooh. Yes? If your land patent has been filed with the, social, or with the uh, zip code, can, and can you correct that and then refile it? Yes. Yes, you can. <clears throat> so when you have to post it again and go through all that? No. All you have is to post as, as an amendment to that document. You have to post it on the board for public view, yes. For 61 days? Huh? Yes, for 60 days. 61. Pardon? Yes, for 61. Yeah, 61 days. Yes, sir. Are you going to return this with that, that kind of address on it without a zip for anything? I'm sorry. Are they going to... Are you going to get this back from them without a zip code in it in that format? That's it doesn't go anywhere, but you pin it up on a boat. Oh, you're not going to send this no. to BLN. No, BLN has nothing to do with it. All right. Nothing to do with it. How many places do you have to pin it up? Pardon? How many places do you have to post it? You have to post it for 61 days. Yeah. Oh, in any public building, courthouse, Firehouse, a library, post office, post office. Within your county. Yes, it has to be within your county. What if somebody, whether it be a jump reporter or anything, takes it down prior to the We're going to get to that. You very good question. That's why you make multiple copies. Remember? Now remember, we haven't got into it yet, and we're jumping all over here. We're going to make a summary of your chain of title. <clears throat> That's usually a one or two page document. Because whatever you make up in this sandwich, we call it, you're going to pin that with two pegboard pins onto a bulletin board. Okay? So you don't want 50 pounds of paper hanging on two little pins. Won't stay up. Now, to answer your question, again, a very good question. If somebody comes along, and takes it down, and you want to check on your posting at least one a week, once a week. When you go to check, take you a true copy with you, 
to replace it. Now we're going to get into the note that goes on the bottom left hand corner, and I'll get into that in a minute, that this document is to be posted for a minimum of 61 days. And then you put the starting date, put that date, and then you put the ending date and put thank you and initial it. And I, what I do is I usually use, either use a three by five card or a sticky, but the sticky staple it on each 45 degree angle. You put a sticky on there in two days, it'll fall off. Okay? But you're notifying any person looking at that document that that's to be left there and is required to be posted for 61 days. You with me? All righty. This is a notice document. <clears throat> you notice underneath my address on domestic, it said notice of. When you have a notice of, it means to everyone concerned. You don't have to put to whom it may concern. This is a notice, because that's what we're posting as a notice. And this is, you're posting a certificate of acceptance of the Declaration of Land Pet. Now, let's address the certificate issue. <clears throat> In law, to bring a land patent forward, you must accept what has already been done. Because the patent's already been done, hasn't it? To bring that forward, you've got to accept the authority and jurisdiction <clears throat> and the right to go along with that. That's what this document does. <clears throat> and you have to do it to all the world in a public notice and a public place. Are you with me thus far? Yes. You can also post it in a newspaper, can't you? Yes, you can. Thank you. You can post it in a newspaper. <clears throat> the disadvantage to putting it in a paper takes quite a bit of space. In other words, you're going to pay to have it. Yes. You have to post it. You only have to post it in a newspaper that prints it. Hang on a second, Rex. The newspaper you post it in must print at least one day a week. If you print, if you post it in the yes. flathead paper, they print every day, and it'll cost you six hundred dollars mm -hmm. for yeah. the sixty-one days. Yeah. So <laughs> in those cases, you're better off to post it. Did you hear what he said? The cost. And that, that it would cost to put it in for the 60 days, about 600 bucks to get it in the newspaper. A daily paper. So, or whatever the cost may be. Yeah, it's, if it's a weekly yeah. paper, it's not quite a week. Pardon? If it's a weekly paper, it's only once a week. No. And no okay, problem. but whatever, all I'm saying is that whatever it costs, you're going to have to pay for that. When you post it on a bulletin board, it doesn't cost you your time and two pegs and your, your paperwork. Ron, so are you suggesting that if you go the newspaper posting route, you have to put every document in this five documents? Uh, yes, language, you bet. Not just the no. You've got to put it all. Can you shrink it's it? It's all a legal document. Can you shrink it? Can they be, uh, <laughs> yeah, you can shrink it. Yeah. yeah. You're talking about the document with a company by the chain of commerce. I'm sorry, Peggy. A company that. The notice accompanied by the chain of title? You have your summary of chain of title. All, all, five all the documents that I have. Just the you. summary page or the actual document? Too. No, the summary page. Okay. Yeah. All you're doing is alluding to that, and then you have another notice page we'll get to. Let's hold off and we'll get to that, and I appreciate the question. But there are certain things that you have to do in sequence. It needs to be in the order that I've shown there for the purpose. That way, everything is in sequential order. Yes. If you own numerous parcels that are contiguous out of the same general tract or county range section, can you do one posting, or do you have to have one for each part? For each individual piece of property it has to be done separate. Now, there have been instances where people own multiple properties within the same patent boundary. Yeah. And in that case, you use the same patent. But all of your other chain of title and everything has to be separate. Yes. 
Ron, your challenge, uh, how do you prove that you posted and that it was posted? We're going to get into that. I'll show you how to do that and do it effectively. Yes. Ron, I'm trying to keep my questions to the end, but I, I was not able to vote two elections on the landowner tax there. And uh, my road in, in, in the country didn't have a number, so I used a post out of the box. They wouldn't let me vote. Yeah. Two, two elections. And that should be my downside. But I had to have a number on the road, but I translated it to at X still I had everything in Montana. Uh if you just put a post on the spot, it just but all we say no. A post office box is a lawful domicile. For the purpose of this document, this has nothing to do with voting and I'm not throwing stones there. I'm saying let's keep apples and apples here. If you understand what I'm saying, okay? <laughs> yes. Do the library and uh, the post offices you, and wherever is there any problem with posting there? What if a lot of them will tell you we can't post that. Then what you say? Every government office, every one of them, is required by law to have a place to post public notices. If they say we don't have that, we can't do it here, then you ask them politely, then where is the place that I am authorized? Where is your place to post a public document? They have to provide it by law. Okay? All right, let's move on. The certificate of acceptance. The land patent has to be accepted. And this is your verification and validation that you are accepting the original land patent. We're on page 118. And that notice is to the whole world. And it shows there the land patent. Do not just put patent. Do not put just patent. And the reason there are all kinds of patents. But a land patent is specific to the subject matter. Make sense? Okay. You list the patent number. Now I want to go back to something that I neglected to say. The patents certified copies that you will receive from the Bureau of Land Management sometimes are not clear. When you contact them to get your copy of the land patent, the original certified land patent, ask them to please make it for you as clear as they can. A number of people have brought land patents to me and the number is blurred out or not copied. i got to sit down a minute, folks. <clears throat> and <clears throat> therefore, on that basis, if you get a copy like that, call the Bureau of Land Management Archive Records Division and say, would you please verify the number and would you send me another one with the number? They can put the number on it, you cannot. That land patent number is absolutely essential to your document and to your authenticity of what you're doing. Yes? I had a request of that sort of the BLM and Billings. And they said, no, if we put her in the marketing bond, it won't be a, a copy. They refused to do it. That, 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 that way I got the patents where yeah. you couldn't read the patent numbers. And I told her, hey, you sent me the patents, but I didn't get any patent numbers. Oh, you did? Well, what's the, the legal description? And they ran off another copy, and what do you know? Did it have the number? Yeah. Okay. But in Portland, Oregon, they will tell you that you can't put the number, but they can. Because they're the they're what's called in law the custodials, uh, custodians of the archive records. That gives them certain privileges that they can do. And that's for authenticating documents. If the number on that land patent is not in fact clear, then they have the authority in which to verify and to prove that it is, or to send you, in the case that you just mentioned, to send you one with a clear number. So to alleviate that delay, tell them up front, please make sure that the signature and the dates on the patent are two critical elements. 
okay? And the land patent number. Because your whole document is predicated upon that identification of that number. <clears throat> you put the date of the land patent, mine was dated August 20th, 1866, and that's DOC attached. That means at the end of my document, there it is right there, I got the land patent. Okay, next item down, knowing all you men and women by these present. You're addressing everybody, in other words. I, Ron Gibson, do hereby certify and declare that I am an assignee in the land patent named above and numbered above, and that I have brought up the land patent in my name <clears throat> as it pertains to the land described below and the character <clears throat> uh, of the said land so claimed by uh, the patent and legally described and referenced under the patent number listed above is da -da 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 -da, Township 37 Powell, Range 1 West, Southern Florida, uh, of Section 9, Will Island Meridian, uh, Oregon, containing 320 acres. The attached. And in my document, I have the attached. Okay? Number two, I, Ron Gibson, uh, in domicile appeal box, da -da 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 -da, Rogue River, Oregon, Republic U.S., lowercase, capital A, non-domestic. Unless otherwise stated, I have individual knowledge of the matters contained in this certification and acceptance of declaration of patent. Land patent or patent? Or land patent? To be land patent. Okay. Yeah. Insert land patent. I didn't do it on this one, but all the ones since I've done Okay. I am fully competent to testify with respect to these matters. You're saying, well, why is that in there? That's in there because it shows that you are, number one, competent to do this document. See, there's a problem in law of doing documents from incompetent people. You're proving here that you're competent. And who better to say that you're competent than you? Okay. <laughs> like the guy said, well, I just want to get everybody to know I'm perfect. I don't know where you stand. But <laughs> <laughs> okay. Number three. I, Ron Gibson, an assignee at law and in a bona fide subsequent purchaser by contract, a certain illegal described portion of land patent under the original comma certified land patent, and I refer to the number. I am being very specific here about what I'm talking about so that nobody can come along and say, well, you didn't have it really describe it, and that happens. So you want to make sure that you properly identify what it is you're talking about and referring to. Very important. Ron, okay. Ron are you saying I am an assignee at law because you're an attorney, or is that what we all put? That's what you all say. Okay. You're, what you're doing is in law. Assignee. Assign okay. In law. okay. What you're doing relative to this is lawful. Gotcha. And you're just stating that. Okay? The only thing you change, or I would recommend that you change, is your particular land description, your patent number, your domicile, your name, that kind of stuff. Okay? okay. <clears throat> David, August 20th, 1866, would do the authorized and to be executed in pursuant of the supremacy of treaty law. Why do you suppose I put treaty law there? That's where the authority and jurisdiction came from for the patent, isn't it? Now here's what's interesting about that, folks. If you've got reference to the treaty, who and how are they going to defeat the treaty? That's why it's in there. This 
this is an insurance policy, if I can put it in that context. You want to make sure that all of your ducks are in a row. Just in case. I have a saying called the 5B principle. Proper planning prevents poor performance. Okay? Do take the time. Use mine as a copy or have Rex help you with it. But you want to do these right. Yes? Um, using old language like that, basically, in a sense, you're saying it protects us from any new language coming. That is correct. Ours be. Okay. That's, that's exactly what it does. Okay. Okay, the treaty at law, <clears throat> citation and constitutional mandate. Why did I mention that? It's mandated. Where are the patents? By what authority are the patent issued? By the Constitution in it. Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2. Herein, reference where, <clears throat> whereupon a duly authenticated, true, and correct lawful description. That's why your meets and bounds is important, folks. You want to be correct and accurate of your land description. I've read cases where people have done it wrong, some by accident, they got out of it, but they were charged with criminal theft of land. One lady in California was doing this to other people's land and trying to take their by using this process, and it got the land patent process a real black eye by one woman who wanted to be a horse behind it. A crook, if you please. There's a moral obligation here as well as a legal one, is what I'm trying to tell you. Okay, together with all the rediments, uh, tenements, preemptive rights, Appertents there too, and lawful and valuable consideration which is <clears throat> appended here too, and made a part of this notice a certificate of acceptance and declaration of land patent. See attached again. I did this so I want everybody to know I know what I'm talking about and I can prove it. Go see my attached document, okay? Because you can't put the land patent on this document, so just use the attached. Yes? Why are your mineral rights? Would you want, not want to make the motion? Hang on a moment. Okay, what about your mineral estate that came down with the patent? I'm sorry, stay again, I'm sorry. The mineral estate. Okay. If it's still attached to your land, it came down from the land patent. If there is a mineral estate, it will stay so on your land patent, and it will be signified by subject to about three quarters of the way down in your land patent. And I'll read one to you. Later. But if it has been severed from the land, then the land patent. It doesn't change the process of the land patent because then you're dealing with only a surface estate. Okay? Well, but sometimes like 50% of your mineral rights, has, like I've seen many instances where uh, the land bank foreclosed on farms and then they sell the farms at a sale and they keep the mineral right. But I'm not sure of your question. Okay, if you want to protect those mineral rights, would you include that in your... Then you do a separate filing on it and they can't sell it, they can't take it. Separate. And that's the reason, but then there's a lot of case law on that very point. Thank you for being patient with me. I had some damage from Vietnam and I had some kind of hard time here. But that is a separate estate if there's a mineral on your property that was segregated out in the patent. If you have a patent and they later found, that's what I referred to earlier as the noble decision. Okay? But you document that. I've on my own property a file for the minerals underneath the land that I already own. But it was a separate estate. It says so in the homestead certificate that I got, the patent. So I just went, filled out my paperwork, filed it with the county, sent it to the BLM, got an ORMC number on it. Now I own the memo. They can't come and take the memo. And I have it done right. <coughs> yes. Is there a way that 
all the people who have done the in the United States and everybody in this room form a coalition, but they come after one, they got to come after us all. No, because they're individual. In other words, you could form a co-op for the sake of trying to protect each one, but the challenge could never be against all of them. No, not the challenge, but everybody jumps into the courtroom and, and fights. Most well, certainly. If enough people went into the court, and you bring up a good point. You know, when you got a neighbor, a friend, a relative going to court, get your hind end out of your chair and go and pack that court out. Now, I'll tell you what that does. I had a judge tell me, a judge told me that. He said, you know, he said, of anything that us judge fears, he said, it's a mass of the public. And I said, why is that? He said, because I got an election coming up pretty quick. I got an election coming up. Okay? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They're afraid that enough people see the horse crap they're doing, they'll vote them out of office. You want your party to win, you pack that courtroom. That isn't good enough, and you put an article in the paper. In our county, we ran a judge clear out of the county, lost the judgeship and the whole thing because he was horsing around and stomping on people's rights, and we said, that's it. And the people rose up like the Bundy issue. They fear you and I people in numbers. They fear you. And especially if you're knowledgeable and know what you're talking about. Knowledge is power. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> and I'm going to move on but use this as a guide if you have any questions Rex can help you we're marked along in our time here need to take a break here in a little bit can I ask about maybe a typo that might be in there pardon it might be a typo in number five well, just wondering in the middle line it says Equitable interest on any in? Is there a word missing? Yes, it is. Thank you. What's missing? <laughs> it should be in a court of law. Equitable interest in a court of law. So we are to strike out on any? Yes. So not law, but but uh, interest in block out on any. And then the, the number is supposed to be 60? Yes. This is not the original one I did. This was my worksheet. And when I put it together, I used the wrong one. So, yes. Yeah, number four, you, you say, I have assigned the entire track. But in a lot of cases, you would say, Courts were no that fact. You wouldn't have the whole thing like no at the beginning he puts no claim and the first word that he does not claim all of it. I don't know. I've been assigned the entire tract of land. No claim described no in the original patent though. No claim no is claim. made that he claims it. Read the first no. couple words. Okay. Oh. Right. Okay, go on through number six, when they're lawful, lawfully qualified sovereign, American individual, has a claim to title, is challenged the court of competent, original, and exclusive jurisdiction. That is such a critical statement, folks, because most courts are not courts of competent jurisdiction. <laughs> And if you're going to be challenged, or if you are challenged, you need to challenge the moving party by virtue of their standing to bring the suit, number one. And number two, you challenge the jurisdiction of the court, that they are not a court of competent jurisdiction. Because you don't have a court here locally, a court of competent jurisdiction. If you're confident about winning your case, 
then in essence, you can instruct the judge that in fact, he can rule in favor of your patent, but he can't rule against it. They hate to hear that. They want to have the power. Tragic what happens in our courtrooms. Okay? Exclusive jurisdiction in the common law Supreme Court, Article 3. When you see Article 3 of a court, that means it's a constitutional court. Okay? Number seven, therefore the said land remained unencumbered, free and clear, and without lanes or lawfully attached in any way, and is hereby declared to be a private land and private property, not subject to any commercial forms, i.e. or e.g. UCC, in other words, Uniform Commercial Code. In other words, you're saying you're not in commerce. That falls under administrative jurisdiction. You're under common law. Your statement for the record, whatsoever. Number eight, a common law of courtesy of 60 days is stipulated for any challenge or two, otherwise latches and estoppel shall forever bar the same against said allodial. Remember our allodial? What does that mean? You're king of your land, aren't you? Owing to no one. Freehold estate, assessment made therefore, and to the contrary, notwithstanding. Therefore, declaration after the 60 days from this from the date, if no challenge are brought forth and upheld, <coughs> perfects this allodial title in the name or names forever. Northwest Liberty News, picking the lock on the shackles of tyranny. Okay, thank you. All right. We're back to the page 119. Uh, you notice that I addressed the issue of different jurisdictions having to do with your land patents, documents. Uh, those are kind of self-explanatory. And then the last paragraph on there is additional uh, lawful authority having to do uh, with your rights and entitlement having to do with your land patent. On page 120, your document, when you complete this, do not, do not have it notarized. You're saying, why not? Because notarized documents came in after the issuance of the land patent under common law. You have three witnesses, and we used to use only two witnesses. But I found a case, and this is really kind of my preference, and I'll tell you why. Two witnesses in testimony is about equal, not supposed to be, but the court's considered about equal with the testimony of a notary. I read several court cases that said three witnesses supersedes the, te the, the testimony of a notary. In other words, the notary says, no, this is this, and three witnesses testify to the contrary. The courts are bound to, to take the credence of the three witnesses. Okay? So that's the reason that I put three yes. And you said the notarization is a post patent practice, post that is after patent, yeah. post patent practice, it's, it's notarization. That came into practice after the land. That's correct. Okay, so that's why we don't do that. But also, the court cases have stated that the courts consider three witnesses superior. to be superior to a notary. And a notary is a state agent. And does the state have any authority or jurisdiction in your land patent? No. No, they don't. Okay? So you see kind of why we do what we do. The reason being you want this thing to be as secure and correct and accurate and moral as you possibly can make it. Yes, sir. We have yes. security and authenticity. What if we choose three witnesses and let's say the government or somebody makes a report 
Because the witnesses are a matter of record. Okay? That's why we build a, what I call a war chest. That means your record. You get a document in the mail from the Internal Revenue Service or from a state agency or whatever. You want to answer that document. Do not throw it in the trash. <coughs> the first thing that I recommend, depending upon what it is, and I'm kind of generic in here, but you want to ask first thing, what is your authority to send me this document? Okay? I can tell you a story, and I want to make it real short. I had a friend of mine, owns a ranch. The land patent has been land patent since 1847. Before the state of Oregon was even a state, Oregon didn't become a state until 1859. The do gooders of the government decide that the Department of Geology and Mineral Industry is going to come and demand that he get a conditional use permit for a rock pit that had been there for 80 years, way before there even was any regulation having to do with that kind of stuff. And I'm telling them, they came at him like a hungry pack of wolves. Lyle came to me and said, Ron, what do I do? I said, very simple. I said, I'll write a letter for you. You sign it, you send it back. First thing I did, I challenged their authority of which to infringe upon private property. I said, I want it in writing. So they sent me back a bunch of war ass stuff that didn't even have relevance to the subject matter. So I wrote him another one. I said, the documents I received to you from you on such and such a day are, are uh, totally irrelevant and have no bearing on the subject matter at hand. Would you please, I uh, once again request that you provide with the proper authority and jurisdiction. So they fussed around and sent one more document, so I countered that. And then they said, well, now that you don't have a permit, you've got an oversized rock pile. In Oregon, <laughs> if, under administrative law, you can only have 5,000 yards per year that you crush. You've got a rock crusher there, been there forever. And I said, well, that's interesting. So I wrote an affidavit of fact. And I stated to the Department of Geology and Mineral Industries, I said, identified who I was, identified that my family lived up the road there for the last 65 years, and that the very fact that I can personally testify and will testify in a court of law to the fact on behalf of Wildwood Talk that in fact that pile of rock is not in excess of 5,000 yards. And I gave them my my resume. I've been a managed consultant for 19 years of mineral development, rock crushing, and whatever. I've owned rock crushers. I was in the crushing business for about 12 and a half years. I know a pile of rock when I see one. <laughs> and I stated that. And I said, furthermore, I said, here's the problem that you people have from the government. I said, now you're in violation of federal law, Title 18, Section 242, 241 and 242. And I think I addressed that in the book. It's called deprivation of right under color of law. Here a man has a land patent, has had it since 1840, 1842, whatever it was. And they're claiming jurisdiction over something that they have no jurisdiction over. And now they're committing fraud against him by misrepresenting the value and the quantity of his personal property, his rock. And I said, I'm going to testify on his behalf of the criminal activity. And I gave him my background in law. And I said, the other problem that we have here is the very fact that this man has been an outstanding citizen and a contribution to the community for over 80 years. Man was 82 years old. And to me, that's absolutely criminal for an agency to come after a man that has spent his life, paid his taxes, and been a benefit to the county, to the state, to the production of food, etc. And I wrote on my document to them, and I said, shame on you. I said, I think I'm going to file criminal charges against you myself. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I mentioned to you but I'm in the final stages of getting my private attorney general certificate. 
Congress allows three different departments to litigate court cases. Number one is the United States Attorney General. The second one are the state attorney generals. And the third one is the private attorney general. Attorneys have no standing to lawfully litigate cases in court. And I can prove it. I have the documents. So I have submitted the documents to Washington, D.C., to the Senate Judiciary Committee to receive my certificate for a duly authorized and sanctioned uh, uh, private attorney general. And when I get that, I'm going after some people. <laughs> I am sick to death. I'm sick to death of them taking unlawful agency positions. And we have a we have a need for lawful government, folks. I don't deny that a minute. And I'll support that to the hill. But the moment they start stepping on private property and private rights and start taking rather than being a servant of the people, I'm gonna sue them on constructive trust fraud. And what's beautiful about that, their own doings proves their guilt. All I gotta do is go to the public record, pull it, get it certified, file my suit as my exhibit. I have won a number of those. And I know how to do it, yes. Constructive trust fraud. Every elected official is a constructive trust agent by the very fact of elected by you, the king, for them to be the servant to do your business relative to your government. When they violate that fiduciary, they take the constitutional oath. That constitutional oath states that they will uphold the Constitution and protect your rights. I'm paraphrasing here a little bit for the sake of time. And I sue them under constructive trust fraud because what they're doing is fraudulent. And I've got court cases galore. You wouldn't believe my court file. I got warehouses full of court files. I got a computer that's got 31,000 cases on it. In one, I've got 5,300 that I haven't even looked at yet. So I don't smoke, I don't chew, I don't go with the girls that do. But I study. Yes. Yes. You bet. Thank you for asking. The question was, would I define what color of law is? I will give you a prime example. <coughs> Driver's license. <coughs> Politicians hate for me to bring this up, and I love it. <coughs> In other words, a color of law is presented to you, the public, on the basis that this is the law. When in fact the law is here, this sounds like, looks like, appears to be, but it's a phony. A counterfeit $100 bill, if I can use the analogy, okay? Under color of law, that's an intent to commit fraud in the first instance. It is committing fraud in the second instance. And it also is a violation of the fact of full disclosure. Full disclosure is a very important term that you need to understand. When you sign a document for a driver's license, the state never, never divulges to you what you're giving up of right in order to receive a permission. That's color of law. You in real estate especially, Boy, their disclosure's got to be made about everything in there, or supposed to be. And instead of our people, and that's why our elected officials are so important, you need to get people, and the Bible tells us that we need people with a godly heart. The second thing along with a godly heart is people who read, know, and understand the Constitution. And if we're going to fix this problem that we have in government, we had better pay attention to who we put into office. Thank you very much. It makes me ill to hear some of the justification of some of the people of why they, oh, I like the way he combs his hair, so I'll vote for him. 
when in fact he fills them out at every vote. But color of law simply means that it is not the truth. They're proclaiming it to be the truth, but it's actually an actuality, a misrepresentation of the fact. That's what color of law is. I want you to go, it's in my book, to Title 18, USD stands for United States Code, Section 241 and 242. Okay? Title 18, Section 241 and 242. Did that answer your question? Okay. All righty. Go to page 121 quickly. These two pages here represent what I did because I acquired my property by virtue of a quick claim deed and not by a land sales contract. What you will put in, in replace of this on yours will be the copy of your warranty deed, just one paper or two at the most, that has your name, the buyer, the date you bought it, and the property description. That's what goes here. Okay? Page 121 and 122. Both of these documents are part of my quick claim deed when I acquired the property. That's what you put there. Yes, sir. Does it matter if the property is in a trust? It depends. The question was, does it matter whether the property is in a trust? It depends upon whether the trust is the owner or the holder of the property. The patent has to be brought forward in the individual's name. It cannot be a trust or color of law. Just so you know. We use them, and in administrative circles, it, it has the front of it. But in reference to law, L-A-W, it is a color of law. It's used only in an administrative jurisdiction, yes. So if you have an LLC that is owned by you, and you have an adjacent contiguous property that may be your primary residence. That but that's an administrative jurisdiction creation. Well, that works. Well, <sighs> even though the LLC is still owned by you. The LLC cannot own a land patent unless it was con acquired from an individual as a patent. Okay. Yes, sir. Right. I just one question on what you said earlier about the three witnesses. Yes. Now, uh, the, I believe the courthouse requires anything to be recorded to be notarized, and I noticed on your example is notarized. Yeah. So. I'm just okay. giving you the example okay. that if you want to have it notarized, it's fine. No, I would rather not, but is it a requirement to have something recorded at the courthouse that it be notarized to be reported? No. Okay. They may claim it is, but I can tell you that it doesn't. Before they had notaries, everything was witness. Yes? Do the witnesses all need to be present at the same time? Can you collect them over time? You can as long as it's dated when they witness. But the problem with that, let me clarify that, they're, you're, they're witnessing your signature. Right. So they need to be there, whatever, right. okay? Yeah, so witnesses need to witness each other as well as you. Right. right. That's the way to properly do it, yes. And non-family member. No, it can be a family it's member. A family member. There's someone to prove that you signed that document. Okay. I may have a dumb question, but on this whole document, the first document on page 118, can the margins be changed so that you can fit it like on one piece of paper? I'm sorry, say again. Can the can the margins and things be changed? Any of the spacing so that you can fit it on just the front and the back? Reformat. Reformat. Yeah, you can. The only problem with that, when the people go to look at it, it's amazing. We have found how many people look at these documents hung on the bulletin board. Oh. I mean, the pages are torn and fingerprints and lipstick and candy bars and, you know, 
You hear what I'm saying? And if you're trying to keep that on the board, then when you pull that paper, you're pulling against those pegs. So you should print these on separate pages. I would recommend it. You can do what you want, but yeah, answers, but you can put it on both sides. Okay. I'm just saying a little more practical if you can lift one page up at a time. Gotcha. Whatever. For the sake of another three or four pages of, of paper. <laughs> no, this can be done on eight and a half. They're all accepted now, eight and a half eleven. When you had legal papers before. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> Nine point. <laughs> okay, page 123. This is a summary of chain of title. You can do this how you want. Yes, Dick. Uh, yeah, I can do it on 8 and a half by 11. But when you go to report, you have formatting requirements placed on, on the document by the report. You have to have the top three inch margin and one inch margin on both sides of the bottom. On the first page. Subsequent pages, you need a one inch margin all the way around. Yeah, well, otherwise, you don't follow that rule, it'll cost you an extra 10 bucks. I've not ever had an issue with that, but I appreciate you bringing it up. Page 123. Summary of chain of title. I recommend that you do it like this for several reasons. Number one is the fact it's very easy to read. When you look at that, and you look at my example there, it's very neat and clear to read, isn't it? And that's what you want. The left-hand column is always your seller. Is the seller. The little tiny deal in two says two. In other words, who you're conveying your land to. The middle column is the buyer, the recipient, whatever you want to call it, the grantee. And the right-hand column is the date that that document was executed. Now, this will be different in number depending upon how many is in your chain of title. Somebody was mentioning there that they only had three. I've seen four pages of this stuff. The, the date it's recorded or the date it's signed? I'm sorry? The date it's recorded or the date it's signed? You want to do it the date on the document that it's signed. Okay. And the reason for that, it coincides with your paperwork. Okay, The date that it was recorded that can vary and you can chase it all over the place. Okay, any questions on the summary of chain of title? This, by the way, is absolutely required. And you have your documents at home that are all certified in a nice box. You don't want to put them all in the same place. You got a safe deposit box, I would take and put one copy there. Do not have them in the same place. We've had several instances of fire and burglary, and they took all the documents. The fire burnt the place down. <coughs> had to start all over. Okay? Proper planning. All right, next page, 125. This is another notice page. This notice page is to anyone attempting or trying to challenge your standing and your land patent. This notice is to form any person who has a lawful standing. Now notice you want to describe what I said here, a lawful standing, not somebody that wants to come and bitch because you're doing what you're doing, okay? Which means they gotta bring some valid paperwork to you and say, hey, I'd like to talk to you. Don't be afraid to talk to someone if that's the case. Find out what it is that's going on so that you know. Notice to inform any person who has a lawful standing to view this file 
and who wishes to review the complete file on record may do so by requesting an appointment. Now, what I'm trying to say in this document, folks, you're in the driver's seat, okay? You're the boss, you're the king, they got to come to you. When can we do it? You tell them when, where, what time, da 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 They cannot dictate to you because you're the holder of the patent, you're the king. And I list the items that I put in mind. Notice number one, I, Ron Gibson, set the time, date, and place for the review of my documents, no exceptions. I'm not going to let anybody else who doesn't own best my land that I do to dictate to me what I'm going to do or not do. And I don't say that to be a hard task, so to speak. I say that simply because if you start letting the tail wag the dog, you're going to get in trouble. Yes. I'm sorry. I just have to ask this. You keep talking about the king, but I'm looking at your example of a king of title, like Stephen, like Stephen Simone Nick. And I'm only asking this because this is reality. Divorce happens 68 percent of the time in America. So when you have a land cap and it's under two names and there's a divorce, you say that you have protection from authority. What happens? The divorce court can't affect that land value. Can't, can't. Cannot. Cannot. Okay. Out of their jurisdiction. So what, what, did, what did I share with you about the court of competent jurisdiction? What did I address who has the authority to address the land value? A divorce court judge has no authority to affect that property. So in your experience of doing this. And I've had cases like that. So what happened? It forces the two people to come to some mutual agreement. So to one, negotiate there you go. Okay. They're the two that entered into that. They're the two that's got to solve it. You keep the courts out of it. And this forces the courts out of it. You hear me? Okay. Before we leave the uh, chain of title, pardon. Before we leave the chain of title, um, I know we have. Um, so you go to the title company and they do the research. You pay them fifteen, twenty bucks for the research. And then you rebuild the chain of title like this for your packet. Do you need it certified? Certified. Everything that you get relative to your original package of gathering information needs to be certified. From those documents, and you create this, the title company isn't going to do that. No, no. So this document shows in the package as an uncertified page, but you have your title company certified elsewhere certified. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, and number two, I, Ron Gibson, have a summary of chain of title included in this file. I'm just reminding everybody that I got my ducks in a row. Okay, I have it. Okay, notice number three, this document is the total of whatever number of pages. And yours will be different than mine, you, in normal court. The reason that you put the number of pages, you are documenting the number of pages in reference to what actually is there. So make sure you do the proper count, okay? <laughs> then somebody can't say, there's a page in this one from here. Irregardless of whether it is or not, there's always that. Proper planning prevents poor performance. Put the number of pages in, okay? Then, bottom notice, failure of any lawful party claiming an interest to bring forward a lawful challenge it's a lawful challenge. It has to be a lawful challenge. In other words, there's got to be some substance to what they bring to, you, to your attention today. We need to talk about that. Okay? A lawful challenge to this certificate of acceptance or declaration of land patent and the benefit of the original land patent, original land grant, forward slash patent, as stipulated herein 
will be lent and estoppel to any and all parties claiming an interest forever. In other words, you're telling them that unless you come forward in that 60 days with lawful documents after the 61 day period, because you've got the exception of the one day when you first posted, they are forever barred from reasserting a claim against your property. Okay? Yes. Um, two questions. That at the end of your 61 days, they are forever barred. Okay. And then in this paragraph you just read, the word latch, L A P A T G, what is that? That means that anything that adheres to it, that tries to go on on it, tries to attach to. So it is spelled L A C H P. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. The legal term is statute of limitations. Pardon? The legal term is statute of limitations. Right. Any other questions? Okay. Failure to make a lawful claim indicated here within time. Calendar of the 60 days of this notice will forever bar any claim from any claim against my or our allodial patent estate as described herein and will be final judgment. Period. Okay. The next page on page 20, 126. Is a, this is a photograph of my actual path. It's kind of hard to read, but your document will go in place of mine there. Okay? The original. Whatever you, you've had. Thank you for coming. Oh, thank you, Ron. Appreciate you all the information. <laughs> you got to go pick somebody up at the airport. Yeah. Uh -huh. Those documents that you see. On page 118 through 126 are the documents that you put in your land patent sandwich when you go to post it on the bulletin board or whatever kind of really. Is there any question about what we've covered in it? This whole package has to be posted. All of these pages. You're only going to have seven, six. Seven, eight, or nine pages as a general rule. Take you some uh, the pegboard deal with the little buttons on them, you know, to stick it on a hole in the door. And go in this order? Pardon? And go in this order? Yeah, in this order. How many does it mean to make one good enough? Yeah, no, you have to just post one in whatever building. building. There's one other addition that I want you to make note of. Please write this down because I couldn't photocopy it and put it on here. On the very first page of your notice document on page 118, at the very bottom left hand side, starting from the left corner going inbound, take either a sticky pad, I need to sit down a minute, a sticky pad or a three by five card, and you write on that, this document must be posted for 60 days. You don't have to say 61 on it because you already know that anyway. But put, and underneath that, put the starting date. Write starting date and then 7th of June 2014 to, you know, 6th of August 2014. Yes. So if you go and check it, it's not there, you're going to take it down, then... That is correct. I would suggest checking it once a week is what I recommend. And when you go to check it, take an extra copy with you. The copy that you post on the bulletin board, one other item, at the top right hand, remember, you are not posting the original one on the bulletin board. You keep that safe and sound. After the 61 day, then you take that one and you take it to the county recorder to get it recorded. Okay? I'm sorry, what was your question again? Oh, yeah. 
take a, a copy at the very top right hand corner of that, do write true copy and initial it with your initial underneath of it. Okay? If you've got to replace it three times, then have the document that you stapled at the bottom of how long it needs to be there and the true copy at the top. Okay? Does that answer your question or? Well, if, if, if you started it and you had it up for two weeks, somebody took it down. Then put another one up. And does it start from it? No, 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 no. Your time is good from the day you post it. Now let's talk about the posting of the document. When you post a document, you take a witness with you. Very, very important. Take your cell phone or a camera, and when that's stuck up there, you take a picture of it. Try to have somebody that will come back with you 61 days later. The same person. When that's completed, then have that witness do an affidavit of fact. On such and such and date, I accompanied Joe Blow to the, you know, Kalispell Courthouse for the purpose of posting an updated uh, land patent that consisted of eight, nine pages on the thing. We arrived at 1026 and we left at 1103 or whatever. Okay? Have the same person come back when you pick it up and state exactly what you did. The time you got there, that the land patent document was removed. If there is a removal of your document from that board at any time, then you log that. You make note of that. I was here on this date. When you go each week, you write that down in your book. You keep a log of when you posted it, and you keep a log when you went to check it. If you replaced it, you log that down. You keep records. Okay? Any other questions about that? At the end of that 61 day period, at any time thereafter, you can take it to the county recorder. Now, I want to talk about the county recorder. We've had a number of problems with county recorders who refuse to record the documents. And I am here to tell you and we will turn to this in just a moment here. Turn to page 128. This is important. This document is titled, Patents Entitled to Recording. If you have a county recorder that says, I'm not going to record that, they have now violated federal law. Let me explain something to you. A county recorder is a custodian of land conveyance records. The original person that got the land patent that has affected your property that you're doing was required by patent law. He has to go to the county recorder to get it recorded to complete the process. People think that the patent is, is finalized when it's signed by the president. And I can tell you that that is not the case. The law requires it must be recorded. Yes, ma'am. If it's an, on an Indian reservation. Hang on just a second. If that's on the Indian reservation, that also applies? No, they're a separate, they're a separate nation. <clears throat> Although, I've had some Indian cases. I'm, I, I'm not really sure about that. But I do know that Indian reservations, they're, they're, they're under a whole different jurisdiction. But a lot of times they follow the same pattern. Okay? Yes? Well, um, in this area, the reservation is overlapping several counties. And, and so its boundaries are within the county boundaries. So people who are on the reservation with homesteads or intending to bring your land back forward who go to the county courthouse yes. off of reservation. That is correct. And That's it's been right. done in Sanders already. That's correct. Right. If, if their property is under 
that happened in that reservation overlap that they would still come to the county recorder's office to record it. That's correct. The county recorder has a fiduciary responsibility by law to record in a land conveyance document. They are not allowed by law to interpret law. They can have in-house policy as long as that policy does not violate the law. To you as a landowner and a patent owner are superior. You're giving instruction to your paid employee, that being servants of the people, to do what you're requesting to do. And the reason that you want to have it recorded, it fulfills the patent law requirement, number one. And number two, it allows people who have an interest to see what the land is or who owns the land or whatever can go to the record. They're public records. Okay? So don't let anybody tell you that they are not going to record your document. And I want to get into that. You need to know what you're talking about. The first one I put up there has to do with my own state and the statute requiring land patents to be recorded. Judgments and official grants record ability evidence. The ORS 93.680. And there's more parts of that. In other words, the state statutes require these documents that have to be. Now let me ask you a question, the lady that does real estate here. What happens to, so that you share with the people, what happens when you've got a buyer and a seller and the buyer doesn't ever go and record the document? It's still in the seller's name. Bingo. Thank you. See, you authenticate a transaction by recordation. You also authenticate standing relative to that recordation. Now I want to go on. The following are entitled to recording of the record to deed to the county, that means land patents, etc., of which the land lie in a like manner with the effective conveyance of land, duly acknowledged, proved, and certified. Why do you suppose we're certifying our document? They cannot be refused.